Father, we are so thankful and grateful for the opportunity to come together as a family to worship your name. We invite your spirit to fill this place and fill our hearts. And we pray that you will uh, have us leave this place different people today. Thank you again for this great privilege. In your name we do pray. Amen. As it is written on our bulletin, the offering for this Sabbath is for the World Mission Budget. This morning I was curious to know how many Adventist members are there in the world. I don't know, I, I found something about 20 million members. And then I wondered, how did we grow to this number? I believe it is because of the work of the mission that many people who take to heart that God has used to go out and minister to others, fulfilling the great commission that God, Jesus himself, has placed on earth before living to go out and preach the gospel. This, this gospel, this mission is done in various ways. The church has schools, institutions, educational institutions, and by the way, of which I stand as a, a product of. I remember going to, it was grade 10, going to school, and it's a Bible class. It's a Bible class, right? It's a religious class. But it was more like a Bible study to my house. You know, all this new things and the life that I received as the teacher who was a principal then was pretty much preaching about in a class. Uh, God has placed a conviction in my heart that I should become a member of the Adventist Church and be baptized. And I believe many are there and among ourselves are many as well. And so brothers and sisters, I urge each one of you as you give the mission, to the world mission budget, and you think of others who, like myself and maybe like you, who don't know about God, and how much your contribution can go far to support the work of the church, and many will come to know him and accept him as our Lord, and then he will come. So I invite the deacons to gather together.
Father, once again, we thank you for your blessing. And we thank you for the offering that you have brought forward that will be blessing to others who don't know about you and who will further the mission of the church and your mission to proclaim your good news. Thank you for accepting it. Thank you for blessing it. In your name we do pray. Amen. Let us stand together as we sing our hymn of praise. Hymn number 223. Crown him with many crowns. 223. <laughs> Peacemakers plant in peace. 
And then God came down to talk to them about it. And he said, what have you done? And you know what Adam said? He said, it's Eve who did it. But not only is it Eve who did it, God, Adam said, the woman who you gave me, she gave me the fruit and I ate it. So who did Adam blame? Besides Eve, he even blamed God. Do you ever blame God for your problems? No, I hope you don't. Sometimes adults blame God even for our problems. Adam blamed God. If you hadn't given me this woman, I wouldn't have done this. But what did Eve do then? She got the blame. She blamed the snake, the serpent that you made. God, he tricked me and I ate it. So the blame game started right there in the Garden of Eden. And still today, all these thousands of years later, you guys play the blame game, and us adults play the blame game. And you know what happens because of the blame game? We have conflict that doesn't get solved. Because instead of me saying, you're right, I did something wrong, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? I blame somebody else. And I act as if I didn't do anything wrong. And this doesn't resolve the conflict. So I want you boys and girls to remember the blame game. And that God can help you and me and all of us to not play this game. Because this game doesn't help us live at peace with each other. And God wants us to be at peace with each other. Okay? Can you remember that? Okay, let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for these boys and girls. Thank you for their parents who brought them to church this morning. I pray that you'll bless each of them, bless their families, bless us here. Help us not to play the blame game, but to take responsibility for what we've done wrong and ask for forgiveness from you and from the other people that we hurt when we get into conflicts with them. Please help us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
but this one is the one we both want, and we're going to fight over it. <laughs> Conflicts about anything. One spouse wants to use the money to go on a nice vacation with the family. I know that the other spouse says, honey, we've got bills to pay. My brother lost his job. We need to help him. And we need to save some money. We can't just blow it on vacation. And they have a big fight. Conflict can happen with anyone, anywhere, about anything. Does the Bible say anything to us? about how to handle conflict? Indeed it does. Let's pray before we look at what God's Word says today. Father, we want to hear a word from you this morning. We've already been blessed through this worship service. But now as we focus our minds on peacemaking and what you want to teach us, how you want us to grow to become peacemakers, please send your Spirit to help us to understand what you're saying, and also to practice what you're saying, to live it, to do it in our relationships. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let me share with you four biblical principles for resolving or re responding to conflict. By the way, if you didn't get a bulletin, I hope that you will pick one up on your way out at least and get the study guide. And inside the bulletin is another insert also that deals with peacemaking. Take these home and study these more and read these. These are very good information to help you not just hear the sermon today and by the end of lunch it's already out of your mind and forgotten. But you can study it tomorrow. Study it on Monday. Think about what it means to be a peacemaker. The first biblical principle I want to share with you. By the way, there are four principles we're going to share, and they all start with the letter G, so it's easy to remember. Four G's. First G is glorify God. In the Bible, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31, Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Usually we focus on the eating and drinking part. But today we're not focusing on that at all. We're focusing on whatever you do. So even in the midst of conflict, when your blood pressure is rising and tempers are starting to rage, let us remember this verse. Is what I'm about to say, is what I'm about to do going to honor and glorify God? The key question, to ask ourselves, how can I please and honor God in this situation? Whether we eat, or whether we drink, or whether we're in a conflict, do all to the glory of God. When you're driving your car here in Lebanon, Salim, and somebody cuts you off, it can immediately create a conflict. What do you do when they cut you off? Do you yell at them? Do you honk your horn real loud and let them know they did something wrong? Do you quickly pass them and cut them off and pay back? What do you do when this conflict arises? Next time, ask yourself the question, how can I please and honor God in this situation? They just cut me off. Second, G. Second biblical principle for responding to conflict is to get the log out of your own eye. Notice Jesus' teaching from Matthew chapter 7, verses 3 to 5. Even grab your Bibles, please, and open them there so you can see what Jesus says. I, it's on the screen, it's in your study guide, but it's good to see it in your own Bible also. Matthew chapter 7. Verses 3 to 5, red letters, Jesus is speaking, he is teaching, and he says, Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? 
Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, a log is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Oftentimes in conflict, we are so focused on what we think the other person did wrong. We think they have a log in their eye. And we think we've done nothing wrong. But Jesus says, wait a minute. Stop viewing yourself so highly. Your neighbor is the one who has the small speck. The thing you can barely little you can barely even see. The little sliver in their eye. But you have the big, huge log in your eye. Key question to ask ourselves is how can I show Jesus' work in me by taking responsibility for my contribution to the conflict? What did I do to contribute to the conflict? Were my words kind and considerate and respectful? Was the tone of my voice revealing anger, irritation, or annoyance? Was I being selfish? Did I neglect to listen carefully to what the other person was saying or requesting from me? Let's do what Jesus taught us. Let's admit and confess the log in our own eyes. And with his help, we can take that log out. It doesn't have to stay in our eye forever. The third biblical principle for responding to conflict, the third G, is to gently restore. Paul wrote in Galatians 6, verse 1, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. In other words, don't verbally beat up the other person for their contribution to the conflict. Don't blame them as if it's all their fault. Don't play the blame game, but rather be gentle with them. The key question to ask ourselves is how can I lovingly serve others by helping them to take responsibility for their contribution to the conflict? This needs to be done very carefully gently and with love. The goal is not to condemn them for their contribution, but rather to restore them, to help them acknowledge their sin so that their relationship with God and with you can be restored. But Jesus said this should be done only after removing the log in your own eye. After you take the log out of your own eye, then can we see clearly to help our neighbor, our brother, our sister remove the small speck from their eyes. The fourth G, fourth biblical principle for responding to conflict is to go and be reconciled. Notice what Jesus says in Matthew 5, verse 23 and 24. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Wow, that's strong language from Jesus, strong counsel from his sermon. I like what the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary says about this verse. It's in your uh, study guide and on the screen. Christ insists that men must make things right with their fellow men before they can be reconciled with God. So you say, Pastor, so I have to reconcile with my brother before I can be reconciled with God? Well, is that what I'm saying or is that what Jesus is saying? Seems to be what Jesus is saying. Let's look at some more evidence for this from Matthew 6, 15. We're right there in your Bible. Jesus says, 
But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. This is pretty serious, man. That we reconcile with each other. That we forgive each other. That we go and reconcile. Because when we're reconciled with them, when we've forgiven them, we can be fully reconciled with God. Forgiven by God. But there's another verse that the commentary uses to back up their statement. It's from 1 John chapter 4, verse 20, which says, If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? God doesn't want us to hate our brother or sister. That's peace breaking. Rather, God calls us to be peacemakers. The key question to ask ourselves is, how can I demonstrate the forgiveness of God and encourage a reasonable solution to this conflict? Indeed, Colossians chapter 3, verse 13 calls us to forgive others as Christ has forgiven us. That's not easy. On our own, we can't do that. This is why we need Christ in us, so that we can truly forgive others, to truly be peacemakers. Following these four biblical principles for responding to conflict is achievable. It's possible only because of the fifth G, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because of the transformation that Jesus makes in our hearts through his grace and through his forgiveness, only because of that can we be the peacemakers that he calls us to be. Yet, many Christians don't know how to handle conflict any different than the world. Sometimes Christians, oftentimes Christians, fight just like the world fights. Even though we know better sometimes, we choose to handle it in a worldly way instead of a biblical way. I found an interesting diagram explaining how people typically respond to conflict. It's in the, on the back of your study guide. It's even in color. Thank you to our bulletin secretary for that. Peacemaker Ministries designed this diagram. They call it the slippery slope. The idea is that the biblical ways of handling conflict are on the top of the diagram. But people easily slip off the top and respond to conflict in ways that are not following the biblical principles. On the one side of the diagram are the escape responses, also called peace faking responses, which includes denial, flight, and the most extreme one, suicide. If there is a conflict, but we deny there's anything wrong, we sweep it under the rug, so to speak, this is peace faking, acting like there's peace when there is no peace. Blaming others oftentimes is part of the denial response, the blame game. Other times in the conflict, instead of dealing with the problem, people run away. They flee the situation. I'm out of here. At times, now pay attention here, at times, this can be a good response. Let me tell you. The story of Joseph and Mrs. Potiphar. In that story, Joseph fled, and this was the best solution, the only solution he could do at that time, to be true to God. He had to run away, and that was the right thing to do. But in conflict, most often times, fleeing, running away from the problem is not the solution. It's not a biblical way to handle the conflict. For instance, let's say there's a conflict between some people at church. Does that ever happen, by the way? 
No, somebody said. We need to talk afterwards, whoever said that. Sometimes we have conflict in the church. And people get upset. And then somebody says, okay, I'm not coming to that church anymore because I don't like that person. Or that person was mean to me. So I'm out of here. I'll stay at home and watch now what? It happens. Conflict in the church. This is not peacemaking when we say, I'm out of here. That's not solving the problem. Or roommates in the dorm. Conflict. Personality uh, challenges. Dean, I need a change of roommate. I can't live with this guy. This girl's driving me crazy. Get me a new roommate, please. Running away from the problem. This is not going to solve anything, probably. You'll probably fight with the next roommate. Or in marriage. Husband and wife. Have a conflict. Lots of conflict. So somebody runs away to the divorce lawyer. Says, I want a divorce. I can't live with this person anymore. They don't, they don't please me anymore. I can't live like that. Flee, running away. This is not peacemaking. God wants to bring peace to our relationships, whether they're relationships in the dorm, marriage relationships, church relationships. Sometimes it takes time. It's not an easy fix, you know, like we do with the kids. You know, say sorry and say you forgive her, and then we're done and we're happy. Can't do that with big grown-ups or big college students, you know. Samuel? Where's Samuel? Who's your roommate, Samuel? Wasim. You get in a fight. You get in a fight. And Dean Ryan comes to you and says, Samuel, you're a bad boy. <laughs> Say sorry to Sam. Uh, Wasim. <clears throat> Come on. You're a, you're, a, you're a grown man. It doesn't work like that anymore. Sometimes it takes time for you to work out your conflicts. Might not take five minutes. Might take a day, two days, for a husband and wife and marriage problems. The conflict might not be resolved for months, years. Maybe they need counseling. But just because they need help doesn't mean they should just give up and go to the divorce court. The worst and the unchangeable escape response is suicide. We don't talk about suicide very much in church, but we should at times. Because it's an issue in the world. I saw on the news this week there was a big mega church pastor in the U.S. killed himself this week. Young guy with kids. Why? How? It, it shocks us. A pastor. We need to talk about it. Suicide doesn't solve any problems. Your life is valuable. Every single person in this room is valuable. You are loved by God. You are loved by others. If you've experienced depression or suicidal thoughts, don't just hide it yourself and never talk to anybody about it. Come and talk to us. We love you. We care about you. Talk to your teachers. Talk to your deans. Talk to somebody you trust. Don't keep it to yourself. Come to us. We want to help you. We want to support you. Suicide is not a, a solution. It's not going to solve any problems. On the other edge of the diagram, you can see, is the attack responses. Let's start with the assault response, which includes, but is not limited to, physical fighting. Back in April, some of you remember this, our church took a social trip to Baalbek. Two buses full of people. And we had a lovely time up there, touring around there. But you guys remember what happened on the way back? On our bus ride? We're just cruising down the mountains and two cars passed us, going by very fast. One was chasing the other clearly. Shortly after that, they pulled off to the side of the road. Apparently they wanted to talk to each other about their conflict. But a few minutes later, they came speeding back by us again, going very fast. And then, a moment or two later, a few minutes later, 
they stopped in the middle of the highway, hopped out of their cars, and the two men came at each other for a fight. Our buses were behind them and came to a screeching halt. And our buses, our bus drivers, put it in park, jumped out of the bus to go break up the fight. And some of you in here were on that trip and you jumped out of the bus to go break up the fight too, I remember. And I was like, what's happening? Why are you getting back in the bus? Someone could get hurt out there. This is what I'm thinking, I'm shocked. What is going on here? I remember Servan was one of them who jumped out. This guy, he just got married last week, Sunday. And I remember when we got back after this conflict resolved, you know, they broke up the fight and the guys got in their cars, drove off. We came home uneventfully, thank God. But I got, we got back here and I'm talking to people about this incident and Servan and I are talking and he tells me, I'm, I'm saying, man, what if one of these guys had a gun? And Servan's like, yeah, the guy said, I have a gun in my car. I'm going to go get it. <laughs> For what? Because the guy cut you off or he didn't drive fast enough in his car? You're going to get a gun and kill somebody? I mean, the women, the wives it, were jumping out of the car and joining the fight, too. It wasn't just the men. <laughs> so I'm not trying to pick on the guys. It's the ladies also. This is the conflict. This is the assault. <laughs> Do Christians act like this sometimes? I don't know if they were Christian or Muslim. Well, by, based upon by the, the ladies, they were dressed as Muslims. But would Christians act the same sometimes? If we're honest, we could say yes. Christians could do the same thing. This is not how we should act, though, as Christians. But you say, okay, pastor, I'm not crazy. I'm not going to jump out of my car and fight with somebody like that. Okay, fine, good. I'm glad you won't do that. But you could assault somebody in some other way with your tongue. Your tongue. You could beat somebody up with your tongue. You could go and gossip with your friend or your roommate, and you could tear down somebody else completely by your words. Destroy them. Could be a roommate, could be a colleague, could be a classmate, could be a church member. Did you know so-and-so did such and such? How could they be doing that? Go tell the pastor. Let's kick this guy out of church. He's just not right. Gossip destroys lives, destroys people, destroys relationships. It's peace breaking. Proverbs 26, verse 20 says this about gossip. Without wood, a fire goes out. Without gossip, a quarrel or a conflict dies down. In other words, without gossip, a conflict de-escalates. This is what we want. Be careful with your tongues. Moving on, though, taking somebody to court is another type of an attack response. Let's just sue them. They did us wrong? Take them to court. Happens in Lebanon, happens in America, happens around the world. Even Christians suing other people, even suing Christians. But the worst attack, which is also irreversible, is murder. You see it in your study guide here. Murder. You say, Pastor, I'm clean on this one. I haven't ever murdered anyone. Good for you. But let's go to the heart of the issue. Let's go past just the physical murder. What about hatred? The Bible says if we hate someone, then we've already murdered them in our hearts. So this one does apply to us if we harbor hatred in our hearts towards someone else. We've talked about escape responses. We've talked about attack responses. Now we need to end this message with a focus on peacemaking responses. As Christians, we want to respond to conflict in one of these six ways on the top of the diagram. Proverbs 
Well, there's the, okay, so there's two different types personal peacemaking, assisted peacemaking. Personal peacemaking includes overlooking an offense. Proverbs 19, verse 11 teaches this. Sometimes a conflict isn't worth it. Just overlook it. It's not worth fighting about. With the crazy drivers in Lebanon, I've resolved to overlook it. What's the big deal if I lose one minute of my time because this guy cut me off and I missed the light and I have to go next? Oh, big deal. Not worth fighting about. As Christians, we want to be very sensitive about offending others. Usually we want to avoid offending people. At the same time, we need to not be too sensitive in how easily we are offended. In other words, we need to have a thick skin so that we're not offended easily. But we need to be thin-skinned about how we might be offending somebody else. Because we don't want to offend others. We don't want to damage the relationship. Peacemaking also includes reconciliation. This involves confessing, apologizing, and forgiving each other. Each side should admit their contribution to the conflict and apologize as needed. Additionally, when the relationship is, uh, even when the re relationship is reconciled, sometimes there's further work to do regarding material or financial issues. So sometimes we need to negotiate. Sometimes we need help with this even. Getting other people involved so we can have a reasonable and fair solution. After we do the personal peacemaking attempts, sometimes we need to get help. Jesus said himself, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault between you and him alone. But if he doesn't listen, then what do we do? Bring somebody else, one or two people, along so that there can be a neutral examination of what's going on and fairness and a desire to resolve the conflict. If mediation doesn't work, or having a mediator there, then there's accountability to the whole church. According to Jesus, the issue goes to the church body, which can hold people accountable for their sinful behavior. Another form of assisted peacemaking is arbitration. Perhaps surprisingly, the Bible recommends the church appointing judges within the church to handle disputes, rather than going to courts with judges who are not even believers. I don't have a word. Paul's point is that believers who are appointed as judges within the church should have more wisdom to make a right judgment than the unbelieving civil judges. This might sound strange, but it's in our Bibles. Certainly with God's help, Christians surrendered to his will could make righteous and fair judgments even in legal disputes, financial disputes. <clears throat> Friends, as we conclude today, I want to appeal to you. Don't be a peace breaker. Don't use these attack responses. Don't be a peace faker by running away, denying, blaming, playing the blame game. Instead, Ask God to help you be a peacemaker and use these peacemaking responses. Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Let us be the children of God. Is hymn number 634. Let's sing this as we stand. Come, all Christians, be committed. We've heard a wonderful message. Let's take this message to heart and ask God to help us be peacemakers. Shall we stand?
Father, as you said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called your sons, and we want to claim that promise. We want to be called your sons. And so, Father, help us to make peace. And if there is any conflict among ourselves, help us to reconcile with each other and restore the broken relationships. Help us, Father, to reflect your peaceful character in everything we do so others, when they see us, they don't see just merely sinners, but they see you towards us. Thank you for the message that you have received. And thank you for the blessing of the Sabbath and also for the blessing of the baptism of the daughter, Pamela, that will be happening soon. This is our prayer, and as we leave this place, your spirit will guide us in everything we do. In your name, Amen. Amen. Remember to join us at the Baptist day for the baptism. The pastor is there, and uh, tonight the vespers will be led by the pathfinders and will be followed with registration. So everybody is welcome to uh, worship. Have a blessed time.